Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to what I think is both an important and a cherished tradition of UC San Diego, not from a long time ago, but more recently, and that is recognizing some of our best, the best of the best faculty with the Ravel Medals. Uh, I cannot tell you what a great honor it is for me to be here uh, as part of this ceremony and to recognize people. So let me start by saying welcome everybody. Welcome to the Ravel Medalist sitting right there and your honored guests. I just want to start by saying that since the founding of UC San Diego, our exceptional faculty have played an integral role to advance our mission. And literally yesterday, I was at the Regents meeting and I was presenting them the campus strategy. Uh, and one of the questions was like, what do you, uh, what do you attribute the success of this campus to? And they were really intrigued by our research funding, which I think they should have been intrigued more by uh, the significant impact we're making through our graduation rates from 50% 10 years ago to 75% today. But nonetheless, they cared about the research funding. And I had to remind them that we were created uh, as a graduate-only institution, and it was only after three, four years of a lot of negotiation with the state that we became an undergraduate, undergraduate full service institution. So I had to remind them that that's what happened. And then the DNA that created the place in terms of excellence going in has actually propagated, enhanced, and amplified itself. So that's why we are such an amazing campus. So I just want to say thank you to all of our faculty. Uh, and over the last decade or so, uh, we've become more student centered, more research focused, and a more service oriented public university, and the last two words are equally important. A public university is not just a university that has got public governance. It's a university of the public for the public. And that's an important uh, notion to remember, uh, that we, re we sit here off the public, for the public, making a difference for our people, right? So our people uh, do cutting edge research, they expand our collective knowledge, and they improve our human condition. And the honorees today, literally in every which way, reflect all of the properties that I just outlined. And these people also apply their expertise to tackle many, many tough problems. So these are change makers. And they have committed, literally committed themselves to move theory into practice and back again into theory and build a really symbiotic relationship. They challenge students, they challenge faculty, they challenge staff, and most significantly, they challenge the administration in more ways than one. <laughs> And I mean this sincerely in a good way, right? And Larry knows this. <laughs> so during this celebration of our Founders Day, Founders Week, uh, we renew our commitment to excellence, to our faculty, to our students, and to making this institution a better place than when we found it. And we all found it at different points in our lives, different days of the year, uh, different times of uh, the day. But I can tell you we are all committed to moving in the positive direction. So. So let me just say that we will continue the tradition uh, that I think of what Roger Ravel started. And he's the one who wanted this to be a graduate-only institution, right? So we'll continue that tradition by being student-centered, not graduate-only, by focusing on excellence, and by really changing uh, everything around us on a daily basis. So let me just say congratulations to our honorees today. One of our, thank you. What, one of her honorees could not be here because uh, she fell sick right away, so and sh she's not here. But typically, you have to be present to be honored, OK? So just, just making sure people don't look for exceptions out here. Uh, so what is more significant uh, about this honor is that all of her honorees were picked by a set of their own peers. So there were four people who constitute, uh, and the committee changes every year, but this, this committee, there are four people who were involved in selecting the honorees today. And let me just say thank you to the committee members, Katja Lindenberg. Thank you, Dr. Lindenberg. <laughs> Cecil Lytle, thank you, sir, for really. <laughs> Bud Meehan, this Bud here. Bud Meehan's not here. But Bud Meehan, thank you, sir, in absentia. Uh, and last but not the least, Palmer Taylor. Uh, Palmer's not here, but Susan's here. So Susan can accept his thanks. Oh, there's Palmer. I'm sorry, Palmer. How can I miss you? OK, thank you, sir. So, and uh, amazing uh, people, but thank you for 
uh, opining on who we should be picking. And thank you to the honorees. I mean, this honor could not be bigger. You were picked by your peers, not by the bureaucrat, not by the <laughs> chancellor, not by the bureaucracy, but by your peers, your intellects. So let me hand this over to my colleague, our executive vice chancellor, uh, to say a few words, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons. Well, thanks very much, Chancellor Kosla, and good afternoon. Welcome to everybody. It's wonderful to see you all here in person today. I'm happy to see so many who are wearing the uh, founding faculty stall. I think that's one of the unique things about UC San Diego, that we recognize the founding faculty who helped start the university or who helped start units of the university over time, because we keep renewing ourselves intellectually in that way. So great to, great to see you here today. Well, as the Chancellor said, it's that dedication of all of our faculty, our founding faculty and those who have followed that has launched UC San Diego into such a prominent position in the intellectual landscape of our nation and the world. And we continue to this day to attract the absolutely top faculty members uh, the uh, creative thinkers, innovative problem solvers, who then become transformative leaders and teach us new ways to fulfill our uh, student-centered, research-focused, service-oriented mission. And uh, notably, uh, we're seeing now, now more and more that these outstanding faculty work together in a spirit of collective impact to think about what larger challenges could they address if they work together, if they pull colleagues from many different interdisciplinary parts of the university, then no challenge is impossible for them to meet. Now, the Ravel Medal um, is named for one of our most distinguished faculty, uh, founding faculty, um, uh, of course, Roger Randall Duggan Ravel. And um, the medal that uh, Katya is wearing to show how it's gonna be and uh, that um, uh, our, our medalists will, will soon, uh, soon receive symbolizes Ravel's philosophy of how great universities actually um, approach, um, approach their mission, I guess you could say, that you recruit the brightest scholars and the brightest students, check, we do that. You use the world as your laboratory, check, we do that. And above all, make sure that you focus your time and energy on what is truly important. And I think we do that too. And in particular, you who are going to be receiving the university's highest honor um, have been breaking boundaries, have been solving problems, and shaping the future in ways that we do uniquely here. You've renewed our spirit of non-tradition in everything that you've done. And so we thank you for that. We are honored to be able to honor you and recognize all that you have done. So now I'll turn it back over to Chancellor Kosla, who will lead us through to learn a bit more about our honorees. Thank you, EVC Simmons. So today, we recognize four extraordinary faculty who have made an indelible mark on our campus our local community, and the world around us. They're all pioneers in their field and literally at the top of their fields. They inspire and embolden bright and curious young minds, including the chancellor, who's not a young mind, but both, <laughs> neither bright. <laughs> and they serve as community ambassadors to represent this outstanding university. So it's my honor now to recognize these remarkable individuals. So let me start with the first one. Our first medalist, is Patricia Churchland, Professor Emerita of Philosophy. Pat became, uh, began as an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute in 1989 and served the university with distinction for nearly 30 years. During her tenure as chair of the Department of Philosophy, she oversaw a period of key faculty and university growth. Her research in philosophy of neuroscience and philosophy in neuroethics earned well-deserved international recognition. Today, she remains, an act, she remains active with UC San Diego at the Institute for Neural Computation, the Center for Academic Research and Training and in Anthropogeny, and the Swartz Center for Computational Neuroscience. So let's take a look at Pat's career. The video, please. You know, Pat has a very open personality in the sense that 
when you talk to her, you know what she's thinking and you uh, immediately get to the core of the problem. And, and it, one of the things I love about her is the fact that she has these expressions, you know, kerfuffle. <laughs> Who uses the word kerfuffle? <laughs> Pat is a quintessential integrator or someone who brings multiple disciplines together. So she defines the word interdisciplinary. There's probably an entry uh, in the dictionary saying CPAT Churchland. How do I stay curious? Well, I think I, I don't actually do anything. My brain just does it for me. <laughs> And uh, um, there are so many interesting things going on, especially in the field that I sort of adopted later in life, and that is in neuroscience. And I just find the work in neuroscience endlessly fascinating. Pat has retained this innocence uh, that children have, which is, you know, the wonder about the amazing things in the world and doesn't take things for granted. She, she really has this beautiful way of seeing things and, and writing about them that really engage us. And I, I think that's one of her great talents. Pat is being recognized for advancing the way people think about the world and think about themselves in the world. There is something very important as a culture that we applaud and support our thinkers in this way. Pat has uh, international visibility. And, and when I say visibility, I don't mean, you know, that she's published books, but, you know, she was written up her profile in The New Yorker, she, she and her husband, Paul, you know, and, and that reaches a much bigger audience. And I, I think that that uh, is what contributes to the reputation of an institution like UC San Diego. Every place needs uh, someone who is known all around the world. In Poland, when I was an undergraduate student, and in Germany, where I continue my education, I mean, everybody knew Patricia Churchland. We read her papers as, as lowly undergrad students in those far-flung places in the world. She was the, the, loud, the most interesting person to read. We are seeing every day the important role the arts and humanities play in navigating the world. Just as Pat's critical research in the philosophy of neuroscience supports advances in science in general, research in the arts and humanities advances us as global citizens. And all of Pat's research exemplifies this. Pat was able to uh, make UC San Diego the place, the place on earth which attracted uh, people who were interested in kind of fundamental questions about, uh, about the mind. So she was the philosophy bridge, and, and she was the connector, she was the influencer and the attractor, the magnet for kind of UC San Diego, the place to go if you were interested in that approach. I think that a really, really important task is to be able to take scientific results, even if they're complicated and, and mathematically rather arcane, and translate them so people can understand them. Yes, you simplify. Uh, yes, you make it easier. And, and the truth is a little bit more complicated. But the simple story will motivate people to know more. Well, science in the United States is primarily funded by the government. And that means the public is funding us and the public deserves to know how we're using their dollars. And uh, having spokespeople like Pat and others who can articulate the importance of the research we're doing is really important. And I think that she does a great job of doing that. So I think she is many things to, to, to many people, but I think her legacies, I think she's going to be best known as the person who really brought philosophy into contact with empirical sciences and said it's possible to make philosophy relevant. I mean, I was so happy to come to UCSD and so happy to interact with the, the people who were here, the faculty, the students, everything. And it was just enormously good fun. 
And so if there was an impact on, on UCSD, it was kind of a byproduct of just having the best time of my life. So, unfortunately, Pat is not here today, but uh, I'll recognize her at some other day uh, personally, so thank you. Next, our second medalist is Dr. Larry Goldstein. Lawrence Goldstein, Professor Emeritus, Cellular and Molecular Medicine and Neurosciences. Larry is a world-renowned expert in the fields of cell biology, genetics, and neuroscience. His research focuses on brain cell movement at the molecular level and how failures in this movement contribute to neurodegenerative diseases. Under his leadership, UC San Diego established the UC San Diego Stem Cell Program, the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, and the Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center. So let's learn a little bit more about Larry from our video here. When I tell people where I learned to do stem cell research that I say I learned from Larry Goldstein throughout the world. People know who he is, they know of his work. I think because Larry epitomizes the spirit of exploration of UC San Diego, most specifically stem cell research. And I think he is the personification of the Ravel Medal. He has really made a difference, the quality of research all across California. And I think that's um, really amazing. You know, I've always tried to make an impact on people, on science, on, you know, institutional structures and programs. And this environment here at UC San Diego has been incredibly hospitable for that kind of work. I was a transfer student to UC San Diego, so I came from a junior college. I transferred here as a junior, and I didn't have a clue. I was, you know, struggling to survive my courses, and I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. So I had taken a genetics course from Dan Lindsley, who is an uh, icon here. And that was the start of my scientific career. And I, it turned out that I loved doing experimental science. I, I loved the atmosphere of a lab. That was an incredibly formative experience. It, it changed me from a drifter, effectively, to a committed scientist. While I've been at UC San Diego, I've been fortunate to participate in the development of multiple programs that didn't exist beforehand. The genetics training program, the UCSD stem cell program, you know, Sanford Consortium with a bunch of collaborators and friends. And we came up with this idea of having the Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center. And T. Denny Sanford agreed, yeah. A united effort here to take these erudite discoveries and bring them to the clinic with alacrity is what we need. So he was the first one to understand how important this was, and he is now our representative on the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine um, board. So from the very beginning until today, he has been the strongest advocate for um, stem cell research in California. There wasn't that much stem cell research at UC San Diego in, you know, 2004 or 2005 when, you know, we helped make Prop 71 a reality and then we had to have campus programs that would take advantage of it. He got me interested in stem cell research and um, he, he provided um, insight into how you can use different types of techniques like single cell um, sequencing to, to, get, to get new insights. Larry was a very, very strong advocate not to accept, accept stem cell um, therapies without very, very vigorous research. He was very strongly opposed to simply saying, we have stem cells, let's see how they work. He said, no, they should be held up to the same rigor that we do for all types of therapeutics and that we can develop very clever clinical trials to see whether or not these stem cell interventions are going to be useful. I mean, everything that really works and has, you know, real impact is often, maybe usually, some sort of collaboration. And that kind of approach has always motivated me. One of the things I always remember Larry saying when I would listen to him give talks was that the nice thing about being at UCSD was that we build bridges and we don't work in silos. And that's always been a major theme of the work I've done with Larry and then in my own lab. So I always have felt that working collaboratively, you not only your ideas get better and you, you 
quite honestly, can get work done better and faster. You know, I care about doing things that nobody else would do that change people, change lives. You know, when I started working with the government, for example, back in the 90s, most scientists would have nothing to do with that. But uh, the political system has to learn to be comfortable with this sort of work. And if scientists such as myself don't go explain it to them, who's going to do it? He understands how the government and politics works. Uh, Larry was able to work with the um, key thought leaders for the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, with the politicians who are supporting it, with the governor's office, with everyone to um, tell, the, tell the public what did we accomplish and to be fair, what we didn't accomplish. It's a very different political skill that Larry has. And I think without that, we would not be where we are today. We would not have renewed California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. I mean, I often tell scientists, if they don't get involved in working with the government, non-scientists will decide everything about our field, funding levels, regulations, what you can and can't do, and that would be terrible for science. I think his legacy will really be moving the field of stem cell research forward. I think that um, when we started, there were a lot of people who just thought it wouldn't work, who thought we couldn't see what we wanted to see in these cells. And now the number of labs who are using this as a model is growing exponentially. I think he should continue to be recognized for that. You know, if you look at people that shaped our country and were willing to go into uncharted territory, they put their, their lives on the line, their reputations on the line, and they still did it. That is Larry. I think it's very fair to say Larry Goldstein transformed research across California that every single institute that now has a um, stem cell facility would not have had it without, without Larry's championing the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So you know, I've had the opportunity to visit most of them and, and they're spectacular and they would not be there if it, if it wasn't for Larry Goldstein's work. Okay, next is Professor Gilbert Hegemeyer, Distinguished Professor Emeritus in the Department of Structural Engineering in the Jacobs School of Engineering. So Gil focuses on improving safety in our, of, our civil, of our civil infrastructure, including bridges, buildings, and tunnels. Gil led the creation of one-of-a-kind blast simulator at UC San Diego. This simulator allows researchers to develop and test infrastructure to better understand earthquakes and blasts. His research has improved building codes and now empowers the next generation of engineers to create safer and more resilient structures. And his research laid the groundwork for the excellent Department of Structural Engineering that we have today. It is the only Department of Structural Engineering in the country. So let's take a look at Gil's career and his story, please. Professor Gil Hegemeyer is one of the founding faculty members in the Department of Structural Engineering. He had a training in aerospace engineering, and he came here and had this vision to understand structures, and then actually making a lab that can take a full-size structure and test it. He really became, you know, one of the, the first people that could think really big in terms of laboratories, like these just really incredible facilities that he either created or helped create. Well, I'll tell you how it all happened. I was aerospace, I was working on uh, 
rockets that were going to go to the moon and so on and so on. So I was very familiar with the bridges that collapsed in the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. And so I went to NSF and I said, uh, look, I, how about if we take a look from an, a different perspective, the aerospace viewpoint. And the problem was we didn't have facilities for testing on campus. There's something called scaling, right? You, you, you can't build like a little half-size model or a quarter-scale model. It's not going to scale properly and behave properly. And so really the only way to, to comprehensively know is to build it at real-life scale. And I finally went to the chancellor. I was lucky. That was Richard Atkinson. And he saw, he saw the problem, he saw the vision, and he worked with me to build the facilities that you now see. He was really important in that respect, you know. To understand big things, you have to test big things. And I think he, he got that and knew it. And so, you know, with, with maybe a few other of his colleagues at the time, really were able to develop new ways of testing that, you know, we're, we're, we're all still using some of these techniques now and have built off of it. But he was definitely involved in pioneering the, the joining of civil structures, concrete materials to aerospace materials and encase concrete structures with them to dramatically improve their, their seismic performance against earthquakes and things like that and reinforce them or repair them. Uh, and then later on apply that to, to the explosive blast. And you know, that was, I think, very groundbreaking. You know, I got into the blast business after watching in 83 in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, what happened to the Marine barracks. I could not believe it. You know, a truck bomb took down that structure and the collapse of the structure is what killed most of those folks. One column that, was, that failed in that building caused that catastrophic collapse. So the things we try to do, whether it's earthquakes or blast, is to prevent the, the collapse first of the structure because that can lead to, to a lot more deaths than the actual blast load in, in many cases. In the past, when people were trying to study the effects of blasts on structures, they would put an explosive device next to the structure. But when this explodes, you have a lot of uh, dust and gases, so you're not able to visualize what's happening. And so this was just an impossible task out in the field. So I decided, look, let's, let's go build a blast simulator. That can basically create, use impulse, impact impulse momentum to, to simulate very fast rise pressure pulses on structures. Because there was no dust or gas, you could see the full process of the, the explosion. So in addition to understanding how blasts affect structures, he was able to come up with ideas on if the blast happened, how could the structure still survive? And, and I understand that he's consulted with and, and has applied a lot of his knowledge to a lot of U.S. embassies and things like that. It's one thing to do a design analysis. Computer simulations are great. Now, once you do a full-scale or large-scale test, it's hard to argue against the result. That's what Gil has really has been able to do so exceptionally from you know aerospace to structural engineering, from earthquakes to blast. Um, he's really found a way to tie in applications that really change the way that we design structures. I think Gil's legacy that is living on within the department are the world-class research facilities that we have. In addition to the, the hard infrastructure, he also recruited some of the people that are um, working in the laboratories. And just seeing the people he's been involved with and what they're doing, what we're doing, um, definitely I think he's, he's, he's built a future of resiliency among people as well as is among structures for sure. It's rare in life that you get, you meet people that you feel connected to as well as you just want to hear about what they're doing. And I think a lot of us, we just learned so much from him. And so, you know, my, my career wouldn't be anywhere close to where it is without him. What I've done at the university is to add a new dimension. And that dimension has been structural engineering viewed in a little different light than is traditional. And I, but again, I think it's been a new dimension and I think it's, it's been good for the university. Well, what else can I say, right? <laughs>
as a side note, just recently we upgraded that uh, simulator to six degrees of freedom. You know, right? Finally, the dream came true. Finally. It's really significant that we have that. One of the unique facilities in the country, actually in the world, nearly. Okay, our next medalist is J. Andrew McKenna. Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry and of Pharmacology. Andy is a global expert in computational and theoretical molecular biophysics. His work in simulating molecular dynamics has led to many drug discoveries and development of widely used therapeutics. In the classroom, he's dedicated and highly successful and a well-recognized mentor to his students and to faculty alike. And more than 80 of his previous students and postdoc researchers have become tenure-track professors themselves. So here we are, gonna take a look at Andy's spectacular career, please. Andy McCammon is an amazing recipient of the Ravel Medal because he just is someone who has worked so hard for this campus to promote interdisciplinary collaboration and to support faculty and to just see UC San Diego like you know realize its its grandest potential. The idea of the importance of collaboration and interdisciplinarity is something I've I've had in my mind for some time, but it certainly has been uh, greatly uh, amplified here at UCSD. With my work in uh, pharmacology and my work in, in chemistry and biochemistry, I was able to draw on um, expertise from the medical field and expertise from the natural sciences to uh, pose questions and attack questions that I might not have been able to do otherwise. He joined our faculty and has been a multidisciplinary collaborator. He's in the Department of uh, Chemistry, but he's taught for us in the School of Pharmacy. He's taught medical students, and he's done a variety of things in addition to his own work in computational design. So I. Uh, developed while well, I was sort of daydreaming during a lecture one time a method called computational alchemy and in computational alchemy we can change one atom type or a bunch of atom types into other atom types for example you have a drug-like molecule that has an oxygen at some point you could change it into a fluorine atom and calculate how that changes the difference in affinity of the small molecule for the protein. That's something that, you know, just popped into my head out of the blue and has turned out to be a major, major technique in, in the pharmaceutical industry today. Andy is basically a tool builder and he needs problems to solve in the 1980s. Angaran Pharmaceuticals was developed here on the Mesa and they had a program at NIH that um, structural biology of HIV. And they brought in Andy as a consultant because he was this computational alchemy. That was his famous thing. So they brought him in to try to discover a drug for HIV. And that was one of his huge big first successes because he found this little pocket that opened up and they put a designed a drug to go in there. And that was one of the first drugs for HIV and it's still used today. It's just a remarkable ability to take his tools and make them medically useful. Seeing, you know, the results of computers and physics and biology and chemistry mashed together in the right combination, yielding uh, valuable uh, insights that lead to useful new products is, is certainly one of the, the satisfying things about the work. The work that we do among the different areas of drug discovery has largely been focused on infectious disease. So early on with uh, HIV, subsequently with uh, influenza, COVID-19, of course, but uh, diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, uh, those are things that we're particularly interested in. But the same principles can be used for other kinds of drug discovery, treating cardiovascular disease and neurologic disease. There's still much more to be done. Andy has been very instrumental also in combining academia with industry. And he 
had a very diverse group from the beginning on. He had women and underrepresented and just, uh, he found and attracted the brightest students. People loved to work for Andy. Working with Andy was, for me and for almost every single person who's ever been part of his group, it, it is transformative. You know, these folks are in wonderful positions all over the world. It's a beautiful network of people who have had the opportunity to either train with or know Andy, maybe through a sabbatical or through an internship. He's had just an incredible impact uh, for not only you know myself, which I'm so grateful for, but for really, I think, hundreds of scientists around the world. You know, I feel very happy and very proud that uh, UCSD has, has thrived and, and that I've been able to help in some, some way to, you know, make it a vibrant and successful institution. My nature to see more that can be done and, you know, to want to continue to help uh, developing things as time goes on. There's uh, always more to do. One more time for all of them together. So, congratulations. <laughs> so, thank you everybody for being here to both support and recognize our Ravel medalists. Uh, and now I invite every one of you for a little uh, dinner function there. But while you're doing that, I want all the past Ravel medalists to be gathered here on stage with the current medalists. Let's take a group picture, so please. Thank you. Thank you.